All right. We got a good response on that one. Glad to see everybody here today. If you are a guest with us this morning, we have uh, this little card back in the back table that's called a Connect card. You'll find it on the little black table back there. You'll find it on the, the blue table um, out there in the front. Uh, this will be able to give us a record of your attendance, but it's also a way that we can be able to pray for you. If you'd like more information about the church, just to go on an email uh, list. Uh, you need to update your information. That's always available. Uh, we appreciate you filling that out, dropping it in the black uh, giving box on, on your way out today. That would be great. A couple of announcements. N starting next week for just two weeks, uh, it'll be a two-week class at 9 a.m. Um, it's going to be on the topic of baptism. Um, we're talking about the Lord's Supper, um, church membership, um, but doing so from the most basic of level. So if you have children who are asking questions about baptism and the Lord's Supper and this thing that we do every single week and like want more questions about it, uh, or maybe you yourself were like, I just want to know a little bit more about what it means to, to be baptized, what it means to be a member of the church. This is a great introductory way to, to have those kind of questions answered. So next Sunday morning, starting at 9 a.m., we'll be um, having that class over the next two weeks. And then coming up at the end of this month on the, the fifth Sunday, uh, we will be having our our routine fifth Sunday fellowship, and this time it's going to be a barbecue uh, throwdown uh, where it's going to be some uh, barbecue pork being made. So let's not mistake, barbecue does not mean burgers and hot dogs. Barbecue means let's smoke some barbecue. Beef, pork, brisket, you know, those type of things, let's, let's go for it. So right after church that Sunday, we'll be having a time of fellowship there. Also included in that, we'll give an update on Reach 360, and for those of you who don't know what that is, we'll explain a little bit more about Reach 360, where we're at halfway through this year, and uh, some different details of what's going on in the life of the church. Now, this morning, we have the wonderful privilege of being able to hear uh, God's Word preached from one of our own, uh, Jim Creech, um, this morning. He'll be coming uh, right after this uh, time of prayer to deliver God's Word to us. I'm so thankful for Jim and Karen and uh, just how they care for our church in so many ways uh, behind the scenes. Um, even Karen right now is kind of putting her head down uh, because she doesn't want that attention. But um, Jim is a faithful expositor of God's Word. I believe they've been members with us now for about five years or close to it. Um, which is hard to believe. The time continues to fly. So thankful for them. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and prepare our hearts to receive God's word today. Lord, we come before you this morning. As we have already sung, we've come to praise you. We've come to worship you, to make your name known among all the earth. And Lord, what a privilege it is to be able to sing praises unto you, to declare your glories, to declare your majesty in all the earth. And so, Lord, with that reminder, I pray that our declaring, that our singing, that our praising, that our telling of the nations will not be confined to a room on Sunday morning. But, Lord, that our worship will extend out joyfully in our everyday, day-to-day -day lives. And, Lord, we recognize um, that as we pray for those things, we desire for those things, we long for those things, that our lives would be a, a worshipful uh, testimony unto you. Lord, we recognize that we are sinners. And there are times where our lives give an unhealthy testimony. Or our words may not come across, our actions may not come across as joyful as we would like them to be, Lord, forgive us of our sins. Help us to, to recognize who we are in your presence. And, the, and, Lord, recognize the sin that is in our life. Convict us of our sin. Help us to turn away from our sin. But at the same time of turning away from our sin, may we turn to Christ in faith and with joy follow in his steps. Lord, persevering in the day-to-day, -day, every day of our lives taking each step forward, trusting in you as our only hope in life and in death. Lord, we thank you for the hope that is found in Christ. We thank you for your lavish grace that you have bestowed on everyone who believes. And Lord, we pray for those who don't believe to do just that, to, to hear the good news of the gospel and to believe, to receive Christ 
as their greatest treasure, their greatest joy, and to delight in him for the rest of their life. In all of eternity, Lord, as we will join one day with all of creation in declaring your praises forever and ever and ever. Lord, as we prepare to hear your word today, Lord, we know that there are many things that distract us. So many things that can make our hearts and minds wander. And Lord, we come in with so many burdens and so many things to place before you from health concerns to job-related concerns to just life issues, parenting. And Lord, we cast all of those at your feet. But Lord, today, help our minds be attuned to what you'd have us to understand from the text. Our ears to be able to listen well and not just passively, but intentionally. Lord, may our hearts receive what you'd have us to receive today and embrace these truths with joy. And Lord, may our lips be ones who leave this place today declaring with joy the declaration that you are God and you are worthy to be praised. We ask all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Well, you've uh, settled in and gotten comfortable, but I'd like to ask you to stand again just for a moment while we read this uh, fairly short psalm, Psalm 95. If uh, you turn there, if you have a Bible with you, Psalm 95. I think it will be... Well, maybe it'll be on the screen. I don't know. But I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Uh, while you're doing that, I do want to express my appreciation to, uh, to Jeremy and, and Brian and Patrick, our elders, for entrusting the pulpit to me this morning. Uh, it's an honor for me, and I, I do hope my words will glorify God and, and also be an encouragement to you. Let's read uh, or listen as I read. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. O Lord, we thank you for your holy word, the scriptures, which light our path, which are life-giving and life-changing. Please speak to our hearts this morning, Lord, and may our love for you and our worship of you grow deeper and richer as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Now you can get comfortable. It's easy to see that Psalm 95 is a psalm about worship. It's in a group of psalms uh, in the Psalter together that are about worship and undoubtedly used for Israel's worship. This psalm uh, probably was written for the Feast of Tabernacles, one of the three uh, worship feasts that uh, all the males and hopefully their families would go to Jerusalem to celebrate together. Uh, They would give thanks each year for God who brought them out of slavery and safely through the wilderness. So they remembered those journeyings to the promised land. And this psalm was probably written to remind them of both the uh, promise of that and also Uh, some of the negatives that occurred in that journey. 
It's also a psalm that's used, you might have recognized it, in uh, many Christian worship services today. I myself have used the opening verses, if not the whole psalm, to call God's people to worship uh, in several worship services over the years. Worship's an important topic. It's essential for us. It's a great privilege by the grace of God, and God intends it to be a life-changing encounter with him. But I'm afraid we don't always come uh, with understanding and anticipation of God's aim for worship. It's important because it's an outer expression of our heart, our love for God. And loving God is, of course, the greatest commandment of all, according to Jesus. Every church-going Christian knows that evangelism is important. It is our great commission to go and make disciples of the nations. But at least in one way, um, evangelism is not as important as worship, for evangelism is our lifelong mission, but we'll be worshiping if we're believers. We'll worship for all eternity. A.W. Tozer said, All that Christ has done in the past and all that he is doing now leads to this one great goal, worship. Without doubt, the emphasis in Christian teaching today should be on worship. There's little danger that we shall become merely worshipers and neglect the gospel because the whole reason we are saved is to worship God. The whole reason we are saved is to worship God. So if we neglect worship, uh, if we do it poorly, we'll actually short-circuit evangelism and diminish all the other Christian disciplines. Worship isn't merely a warm-up for the sermon. We've already worshiped this morning, legitimately, genuinely, from the heart and from the mind. Worship is vital because it's embedded in, in all that we do. We don't just do it on Sunday mornings, but we do it all the time. What do I mean by that? Well, the problem is not that we don't worship, but that in our fallen condition, we worship what is false. Consider Romans 125. This is one of the most important verses in the Bible, in my opinion, because it tells us we always are worshiping, but we don't always worship God. It says every person by nature, of every person by nature, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the created things rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Now, Paul, as he's opening up this beautiful book of Romans, the longest book in the New Testament that uh, describes, explains the gospel, which is our only hope, he wanted this foundational truth about worship to be understood before he went on to the other details of the gospel itself. It's really, you see, a worship problem that human beings have as they come into this world with a fallen nature separated from God. It's really a matter of the heart, not merely an intellectual or a behavioral problem. Our souls are a God-shaped vacuum, and if God doesn't fill us, then surely something else will. The gospel itself is all about worship because the gospel comes to change our worship. That is the object of our worship. It comes to confront our sinful condition. It comes to tell us that our possessions, our reputation, our pleasures, all the other things that we tend to treasure, uh, treasure that are less than God is what we're actually worshiping. True biblical worship confronts these idols and invites us to be transformed in the presence of God who is the greatest treasure, the pearl of great price for which we should sell everything else in order to have him. It's a radical change in the object of our worship. So any evangelism or any other Christian discipline, anything else we do as believers, which fails to understand this worship issue that Romans 125 describes, will never create or grow a real Christian. So Psalm 95 divides into three stanzas as it unfolds what worship, true biblical worship, uh, should look like. The first stanza is the first five verses, one through five. That stanza reveals that true worship is exuberant. It's enthusiastic, joyful celebration of who God is and what he's done. Listen again to the first two verses. 
Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Do you hear the enthusiasm in those words? It's a celebration we're invited to in these opening verses. It's a God-centered celebration. Quoting Tozer again, he said, I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the word of God that any man or woman on this earth who is bored and turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. Worship is the celebration of who God is and what he's done. And so worship is to include singing. That's a natural way we celebrate and we show our enthusiastic love for God. It tells us, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Do you sing when you're depressed? Well, maybe you do, but probably not. At least I don't. You usually sing when you're, not when you're miserable, but when you're full of joy, and so your heart is overflowing. It's hard not to sing in times like that. Singing is a direct outlet from a joy-filled heart up to God, the source of our joy. So come, let us sing to the Lord, exclamation point. It's there, even if it's not in the original text, it should be there. Our worship is to include thanksgiving and praise, we're told in these opening verses. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Now these words, thanksgiving and praise, I think are, are fitting for a party, for a real celebration. At a birthday party, what do you do? Well, you celebrate someone you love, right? Family member usually, maybe a close friend. You're thankful for them, you tell them so. You praise them, their good qualities, uh, with a birthday card. You sing them a birthday song. Our worship is something like that, but it's a holy celebration with the greatest joy, with praise and thanksgiving to God who is supremely worthy to be honored. And we have a thousand reasons to praise him. And notice also our worship should include loud noises. We made a little bit of loud noise this morning. I think we could have done a little better. Verse 1 says, make a joyful noise. Well, that word translated noise is uh, actually a word that means a loud sound either with voice or instruments. So some translations say shout joyfully. That's a good translation. We don't shout that often, but sometimes it's appropriate when we think about who God is and what he's done for us. So shouting, clapping, trumpets. We had a great trumpet uh, worship song a couple of weeks ago. Drums. These are ways that we can uh, put an exclamation point to our praise and thanksgiving for God. Have you read Psalm 150 lately? Uh, that's the last one in the group of Psalms. It speaks of such joy and worship that we're told to praise God with a whole bunch of musical instruments, including not just one, but two kinds of cymbals. I think that's kind of striking because cymbals are the loudest, the loudest sound of all in the orchestra. Part of that psalm goes like this. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So Psalm 95, like Psalm 150, leaves us really no excuse for apathy or self-consciousness when we come to worship. If you're in the, in the orchestra and the cymbal is your instrument and the crash is coming up in your part, which is probably only once or twice in the whole song, but it's coming and you can't be timid or self-conscious if you're going to play your part. You've got to be bold and step out and express that exuberance which is natural to the composition. How much more should our worship of God be like that? And the, this exuberance is not manufactured by the worship leader or the worship team. It's not a choreographed affair, but it comes from a focus on God himself. This is theocentric. It's God-centered worship. Who God is and what he's done. We have all the reasons and motivation to celebrate him joyfully because of these things. 
We gather to celebrate the creative power of God. The psalm tells us this, verse 5. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. What an awesome work of creative power. It, it, it's worth spending some time to meditate on that from time to time. The NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that's a mouthful, the NOAA estimates that the world's oceans contain over 321 million cubic miles of water. That's a lot of water. You'd have to fill your gallon milk jug 352 quintillion times to drain it dry. What in the world is a quintillion? Well, you have million multiplied times a thousand gets you to a billion. Again, then a trillion, then a quadrillion, and then a quintillion. For you mathematicians, that's 10 to the 18th power. That is a huge amount of water. God created it by speaking a word. That's it. And on the third day of creation, God caused the sea to recede and the dry land to emerge where the human race could live safely. Jesus demonstrated his power over the sea, you'll remember. If you were one of those disciples out on the Sea of Galilee during the storm, ready to be drowned, you would surely rejoice when Jesus calmed the waves. Here was God in the flesh, whom even nature obeyed. So we gather to celebrate the sovereign rule of our king as well, not just his creative power. He didn't just create the oceans and the dry land, but he controls them. The psalm reminds us of this. It says the sea is his. It belongs to him. It's in his hand. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. That is, God owns everything that exists from smallest microscopic to the largest macroscopic. He rules the heights and the depths, everything in the world and the universe. He even rules over evil, over the de demonic powers, the false gods, the terrible fears of the world. He's not a helpless bystander, but he works all things after the counsel of his own will. Scripture tells us so. If you believe in a God who isn't sovereign over all things, then you are worshiping a God who is not worthy of the name. Above all else, we gather to celebrate our Savior's victory over sin and death. This is the climax of it all. If you read in the book of Revelation, especially chapter 5, you see that that's the, that's the center of the worship of the saints in heaven. Even now, it's going on. They're worshiping the triumph over sin and death accomplished by our Lord Jesus. So the psalm says, make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Jesus is the rock of our salvation, the rock on which we build our house, the rock cleft for me and for you, in which we gladly and safely hide from the holy justice of God against our sin. Instead, it's poured out on the sun, and we're safely hidden in that cleft rock. God sent his own son into this rebellious world to save sinners like us. He came to destroy the works of the devil, to render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Jesus rose triumphantly from the grave, his redeeming work finished, and ascended to the highest throne in the universe from where he will subdue all his and all our remaining enemies under his feet. Last week, uh, many of you, I'm sure, celebrated our nation's Independence Day by watching a fireworks show. We coped with the terrible heat, the crowds, the traffic jams, to get excited over explosive sounds and beautiful colors in the sky. How much more should we make our way to the church's weekly worship service to celebrate the person and works of our great and awesome God? There's another important quality of, of true biblical worship, though. It's not just exuberant, joyful celebration, but it's reverent submission to God because he's our maker and our shepherd. Humble reverence is, is fitting in our worship because God is the majestic, 
sovereign who also loves us and cares for us. Jesus reminded his disciples of this and us as well when he taught the Lord's Prayer to begin, Our Father who art in heaven. It's remarkable. That's the way he started this prayer. Think of all the things that could be and should be prayed for. But we start there to remember how much this sovereign, mighty, wonderful, victorious God is our tender, loving Father. And he's also our loving shepherd. Verses 6 and 7 say, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Well, you might not look like a sheep or feel like a sheep, but you're a lot like a sheep, and so am I. Sheep need a lot of help. They get into trouble. They wander off. They get eaten by wolves and lions. They get caught in thickets. If they fall down, they actually need help getting back up. I looked this up. This is really, I've heard this all my life. It's really true. If they're not helped up when they fall down, after a few days they'll die a slow and painful death through suffocation. So so what an appropriate picture of us (laughs) in the care of our loving Heavenly Father and our good and loving shepherd. Jesus called himself the good shepherd. He won't flee when the wolves come. He leaves the flock to go find the one lost sheep. Sometimes that's you. Sometimes that's me. He guides us into green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He feeds us not only with the good food of the earth, but with his own body and blood. Now, these truths humble us. It silence, uh, silence us. Uh, they silence us in God's presence, don't they? So we're sometimes loud and exuberant and full of joy. Other times we're quiet and humble and reverent. And we can do all of that in the same worship service and indeed in the same song in the same sermon, in the same scripture reading. Notice in verse 6, we're also told that our bodies need to be involved in worship. There are actually three postures mentioned here because the Hebrew word translated worship is actually the word prostrate. It could have been translated that way. So we're told to prostrate ourselves before God, to bow down before God, to kneel before God. Three different postures that we can and probably should do sometimes. Prostrate means to lie flat out, face down, on the the ground or on the floor. Now, why does posture matter at all? Is, Is this just some artificial thing? Well, I'm still learning this, but probably started in my high school French class. I had a French teacher that would Uh, rebuke me about once a week because I like to slump in my chair. Uh, That was my, French was my worst class. I was a pretty good student, but not not in French. I didn't like it. But sitting up tall and straight in posture showed attentiveness and interest in learning and respect for the teacher. Now, we can dress casually as most of us do when we come to worship God. That's perfectly fine. But we should never be nonchalant or disrespectful when we come because we're coming to meet with a God who is not only awesome in every way and sovereign in every way, but who tenderly loves us and laid us down for us as our good shepherd. So raising our hands in worship or bowing before God, not only appropriate because we're in God's holy presence, but it also helps move our heart heavenward. It, it, it orients us in the right direction direction. It reminds us of who it is we're worshiping. The Old Testament saints prostrated themselves in their worship. At the dedication of the temple, we read that all the sons of Israel, seeing the fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshiped and gave praise to the Lord, saying, truly, he is good. Truly, his loving kindness is everlasting. The Apostle John, likewise, when he saw that vision of Jesus in the early chapters of the book of Revelation, said he, it says he saw his hair white like snow and his eyes like a flame of fire and his voice like the sound of many waters, and he fell at his feet like a dead man to worship him. So worship, if it's genuine, is, is going to be full of joyful, exuberant 
celebration. It's going to be full of genuine, reverent submission. But it's also, thirdly, stanza three, hearing and obeying God's life-changing word. This we discover in verses 8 through 11. And this final stanza comes like a shock. It, it really seems so abrupt as you read this psalm. Maybe you noticed this when I read earlier. Um, some scholars even believe, well, this must have been originally two psalms that somebody just sort of tacked together. No, I don't think so. I think hearing God's word, being confronted by the truth and grace of God's word is absolutely essential for our worship service. It's how we find the truths about God that lead us to exuberant celebration or reverent, humble submission. The proclamation of God's truth is vital every time we worship. I'm so grateful I'm in a church that values the preaching of God's word. Though we celebrate the Lord's Supper every Sunday, the table, notice, is, is, is on the side, not because it's unimportant, but the pulpit where the word of God, which even explains why we have the Lord's Supper, this is the central part of our worship. And biblical, biblically informed lyrics in our songs and scripture readings and prayers that are informed by the Bible, this permeates our worship service. Stanza 3 is telling us why this is important. It's a strong warning. We need a strong warning. It's necessary for both non-Christians that gather visiting the church and for Christians who come on Sunday mornings. God's word is a prophetic word that's intended to confront us, to comfort us, but also to confront us, to build our faith, to remind us of what's true, to challenge us because we don't always know or believe the truth. 1 Corinthians 14, speaking about non-believers in the worship service who are visiting, tells us that God's word in the worship service then through the readings and the songs and the prayers and the sermon was expected, those things were expected to confront non-believers so that they would fall to their knees and declare, surely God is in your midst. That's what the apostle tells us there. But if you're a Christian, we need to be further sanctified, to grow up into the full stature of Christ, to be matured spiritually, to be more made more fit for heaven where we'll worship God forever. We need to continually hear God's word because our old sin nature just doesn't die easily. I wish it did, don't you? It doesn't. So the Holy Spirit brings God's word in the worship service to confront our sins, to persuade us, to convince us that God's ways and his promises are true and desperately needed. Now that's what's going on in verses 8 through 11. It tells the story of Old Testament Israel. That's what they failed to do. God was trying to teach them to trust in him, to not look to the ordinary things of this world for their deepest satisfaction, even for their life to be sustained, but to remember that God's promises are always true and that he was going to be with them all the way through that wilderness journey. But it was their unbelief that eventually brought the deserved judgment of God because he continued to promise. He continued to work miraculously to provide for them, and yet they continued to disbelieve it and to test him and to say, basically, God, I'm not going to believe in you unless you give me another sign and wonder to prove that you're going to take care of me the way I think I need to be taken care of. That was the, the sin involved. Unbelief, you hear the word and you think, yeah, that didn't sound so evil, does it? Unbelief, it's kind of a negative word, isn't it? But the Bible speaks of the danger of having an evil, unbelieving heart. Unbelief is evil. God promised to provide Israel all they needed, yet they quarreled with him. They quarreled with Moses, the leader he appointed. They tested God almost as soon as they left Egypt. In that first year, they came to Rephidim. And the incident was that they didn't have water to drink. And so instead of trusting that God was going to provide it, they started complaining and they tested God. They basically said, God proved that you can take care of us. We were really better off back in Egypt. Are you going to give us water or not? So the psalmist records that event, that sad and tragic event. The terrible irony in that story 
is that God deliberately did not provide them water at first. That's what's going on here. God puts us in circumstances throughout our lives where he doesn't quickly and immediately at our beck and call do the things that we think he should be doing. He's testing our faith. He's trying to get us to trust in him and walk by faith, not by sight. He does this all the time. Some of the circumstances he brings are pretty difficult, aren't they? Even worse than not having life-giving water. Maybe it's an illness, a loss of a job, a severe broken relationship in a family with a loved one. In Deuteronomy 8, Moses looks back on this event as they're getting ready to enter the promised land, and he says this, You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. Notice that? He's testing them. Instead, they're trying to test God. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Can you see how we have this same need today? I need this just as much as they did. I think you do too. Hebrews 3 and 4 extensively quote this part of Psalm 95, and they're applying it, the writer to the Hebrews is applying it to Christians, professing believers who are being tempted to wander away, to depart from their Savior and Lord Jesus and leave the Christian faith. We're also not exempt from unbelief, from grumbling, quarreling, putting God to the test. What happens when the earthly things that we sometimes treasure more than God are taken away? What do we do? Well, I don't know about you, but I tend to grumble. We begin to doubt God. If you lose a job, a possession is lost or stolen, you get upset. Someone treats you badly. Rather than remember God loves us, we get angry with them. When our comforts are taken away, we complain. God has promised to take care of us all the way through our journey to the promised land of heaven. Yet we still make our own masses and meribahs. Those are words translating, quarreling, and testing. Same place that it happened, two words to describe what was going on. We tend to do the same thing today. We think we know better than God what we need most of all. What we desperately need most of all is to savor and treasure him more than anything else, to trust him that he is always working for his own glory and for our own good, that the greatest joy is found in living for his glory, not just what I think I need and what I want. He is a treasure that will break the hold of all those lesser treasures, all those little gods that entrap us and leave us empty in the end. True worship brings God's word to bear, to confront us so that with eyes of faith we will behold and experience his glorious eternal love, his holiness, his goodness. He's shaping us to be more fit for heaven. So Psalm 95 ends with a note of great urgency. It says, today, if you hear his voice, when we come to worship, that day is today. Don't put off learning the lessons believing what God has to say, hearing the warning, letting God shape us, letting him break us down and build us up with the truth. So I'd like to leave you with uh, two requests today as you think about worship. Two things I'd like you to do when you leave here, when you go home. First of all, ask yourself a diagnostic question. This is a good question to ask yourself periodically. The question is, what do you love the most? You worship what you love the most. No matter what you say, no matter what you even do, what you actually love most is what you're really worshiping. It's your chief love. It's your real treasure. Is the God who speaks to you in his word that we sing about in our songs that we pray to, whose word we read, is he the one that you love the most? Or would you really rather be doing something else than being here on Sunday morning? Where do your thoughts go when you're alone? What do you think about? If you want to worship God now more than anything else, 
then that's a good sign. If you don't, if there is something else, and that's the way you'd have to be honest and answer the question, I must admit God's not my chief treasure and pleasure. Then I wonder why do you want to go to heaven? That's what you're going to be doing for all eternity is worshiping God. God's preparing us now for that. If we don't love worshiping God most of all, if we don't treasure him most of all now, why would we suddenly want to worship him and not regret the things we lose when we go to face him? The second thing is, after the diagnostic question, what do you most love, is practice worshiping God every day, not just on Sunday morning. You won't worship very well on Sunday morning, one day a week, if you don't worship at all on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. Romans 12.1 advises us as a daily course of life to present ourselves a living sacrifice to God, to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is our spiritual service of worship. You get that? How you live your life Monday through Saturday is meant to be a worship service. It's your spiritual service of worship. It's a worship service. So as a course of life, God expects us to focus on him, to think about him, to include him, to yield to him as only the, the only God worthy of worship. So tomorrow morning, when you're at home or on your job or traveling in your car to your job, include God. Speak to him. You can talk with him silently if you're in the midst of people for a few minutes or a few seconds. You can sing worship songs in your car or at the kitchen sink. You can recall Bible verses. You can give thanks and praise him. Let's practice worshiping him every day with joyful, exuberant celebration, with reverent humility, and with a yearning to hear and to heed his life-changing word. Then when we gather on Sunday mornings, there will truly be a taste of heaven in our midst, and God's glory will appear among us. I'm convinced it is true. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much that you have called us to worship you. You've made us to be worshipers. And, oh, Lord, you know our hearts, the affections of our heart often go astray. There are other things that we're fooled into thinking will give us ultimate satisfaction and joy. And then we go through a period of time and we start to realize, no, those things don't deliver on that promise. They're empty. You alone are the one who gives us eternal life in every way, joyful, fulfilling life, life which is abundant life, full of abundant joy. Or teach us to be true worshipers, and we thank you for your promise to do so if we ask you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Let's stand and respond with joyful, exuberant worship. To our God.